Greetings and welcome to the United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon. My name is Janati Stoliaroff II, and I am the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Here we hold conversations with some of the world's leading thinkers in longevity, science, technology, philosophy, and politics. Like the philosophers of the Age of Enlightenment, we aim to connect every field of human endeavor and arrive at new insights to achieve longer lives greater rationality, and the progress of our civilization. Greetings and welcome to our virtual Enlightenment Salon of November 20th, 2022. Today, our conversation will revolve around questions of trust, in particular trust in expertise, given the fact that many of our society's mainstream institutions have been discredited to one extent or another, at least in the minds of many people, there are serious trust issues with those institutions. How do we still gain the benefit of expert knowledge in a way that we can harness in our lives for our own benefit and for our understanding of the world? Joining us today is our distinguished panel of U.S. Transhumanist Party officers and members, including our legislative director, Jason Geringer, our director of longevity outreach, Ben Balweg, our member and endorsed candidate for Thousand Oaks City Council, Dan Tweed, and our special guests today are Mike Elias and Leah Elias. They are going to tell us about idea market. Now, this is a fascinating concept. It is a platform that lets you make money arguing on the internet. So for all of you who enjoy arguing on the internet, this should be an intriguing concept in and of itself, but there is a lot more depth to it. So welcome to Mike and Leah. And Mike, I will let you begin with your presentation. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be invited here. I really appreciate it. And uh, there's a wonderful intro as well. Um, the impetus behind Idea Market is to uh, create a way for information, especially disruptive information, to become credible without depending on institutions like universities, corporate media, governments, the kinds of institutions that we've typically relied on to take breakthrough or disruptive information and make it credible, make it um, legitimate to the public. Um, the way Idea Market works is it is a network where you can run And this runs on Arbitrum, which is a layer two of Ethereum. So if you have some crypto uh, legibility already, um, it should be pretty straightforward, especially if you use this one minute onboarding link. I'm also not sure why my screen just clicked out here, but um, there we go. So you're invited to write short posts here. And when people rate your posts, you make a thousandth of an ETH. It costs a thousandth of an ETH, about $1.50 to rate a post. And what happens is you end up building a list of people, of users and their ratings, and even they can cite other posts to explain their ratings, even multiple posts at a time. And what you get here is almost credibility by petition. When you start having big names, express confidence in a disruptive idea, then you kind of stop having to wait for CNN to catch up. You, have, you kind of stop having to wait for the Washington Post, the New York Times, or the Lancet magazine to catch up. So as the internet enables um, the uh, discovery and argument of things that have never really been allowed to be uh, discussed at scale, um, Idea Market's goal is to enable people who have actually earned the public's trust in some way have credibility maybe on Twitter, if not through the New York Times or some institution, um, to make disruptive information credible in the same time it takes for a tweet to go viral. 
And I hope it's clear from just that little demo that I gave how exactly that happens. Does that, does that kind of make sense at face value? So essentially the ideas are rated on the website and the more individuals rate an idea positively, particularly if they have a reputation as trusted experts, the higher the score, essentially, the idea receives. Is that a correct understanding? Um, yeah, but I should also mention that the score is really just a summary. It's not intended to be prescriptive. I'm not trying to build just another authority that tells you what to think, that tells you this is true. What we really want to do is simply record personal opinions. And based on people's personal opinions and the trust that they've earned from the public through whatever medium, Twitter, venture capital, you know, otherwise, um, people can uh, kind of crowdsource credibility for information that naturally it would take an institution uh, like a university or the FDA or the Lancet or the government uh, decades, if not centuries, to uh, verify or give credentials to. Does that make sense? Yes, it's very interesting. Now, our friend Mike Lazine wonders, do you need to know cryptocurrency in order to participate in idea market? For the moment, yeah, you do. It, it doesn't, you don't have to know very much actually, but uh, you have to have kind of a basic facility with uh, MetaMask, which is the Chrome and Brave browser extension that allows you to interact with idea market. Um, so yeah, there, there is the crypto functionality is necessary in order for uh, two things to happen. One, for the financialization of idea market uh, so that uh, money is exchanged when I rate a post. Um, for example, I made this post, Psychic Abilities Are Real, from the Idea Market username. And if you rate this post, then Idea Market gets a buck fifty. And if you make a post from the Transhumanist Party username or for your personal username, and someone rates it, you get a buck fifty for each rating that that post receives. So the crypto um, rails are needed for that to happen. And then also, they're needed because. Um, if we succeed, uh, we will become the battleground for the world's propaganda and information wars to play out on. And in order for that to be secure, it has to have the most you know, security possible. It has to be as resistant to nation state level interference as it can be. And crypto rails are the only thing that even come close to providing that kind of robustness. Um, so I hope I hope that makes sense, and I know it's a bit of a pain, but uh, it's it's just where we're at at the moment, and it, it will get easier. And I'm also happy to do one-on-one -on -one calls to help anyone uh, on board into it. Yes, thank you for that. That's quite generous of you, Mike. Now, Dan Tweed wonders how much is one thousandth of an ETH these days? Uh, you said it's about a dollar fifty. That's right. It's about a dollar fifty. So these are small transactions. There's no, quote, money at stake. And if you make one post and two or three people rate it, then you're already ahead of the game. Now, I wonder how you would respond to this inquiry by our friend Jonathan Gunnell. He writes, people can be highly credible on some subjects, but not reliable on other topics. How do you know that a person is speaking in their area of expertise? Yeah, um, the... Judgment of who is an expert on what is inevitably comes down to personal opinion anyway. So instead of deciding for you whether Balaji Srinivasan is an expert in uh, nation state building, uh, we have no choice but to let each person decide for themselves whether that a consideration of expertise is deserved. So like I said before about becoming another authority, we don't want to just be another person who tells you what to believe. We just want to record opinions and provide uh, infrastructure and tools for people to make their own personal opinions about who's credible, which they are going to make anyway with this added ecosystem of information available. Yes. Thank you. And Mike Lazine writes, power to the people. God bless you, Mike. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Leah, you mentioned that there is a one minute start guide that is available to help people get on board. Could you tell us a bit more about that? 
Yeah, I'll just say just a quick minute and then I'll, I'll let Mike elaborate. But there, I have personally gone through the very quick start onboarding right there. You can see Mike's highlighting it. And I'm crypto adjacent. I let my husband do most of the crypto things, but I did follow the one minute onboarding, did manage to get the MetaMask, got everything connected. So I am on board. And like he said, he will help you personally do it if you like. All right. Wonderful. So now I know Ben has a question. So please proceed. Um, I think my stuff is not so much in idea market. I'm going to stand by and let idea market run for a bit, if I may. Thank you, though. Okay, so we'll get back to you. But Mike, uh, please proceed with your presentation. Sure. Um, quickly, I, I see that Dan also asked in the chat, could, could we make the $1.50 closer to a dime? Uh, technically, we could. Technically, we could. We have the ability to reduce the fee or even like eliminate it. But... We had some good signs when we launched, uh, which was September 1st. So it's only been a couple of months. But in the first week of launch, um, we had fewer than 100 daily users. And despite those low numbers, at least 10 made 50 or or $100 on their posts within the first couple of days. And all it took was about the same effort as it took to write a tweet. Um, so since it doesn't take that many users uh, to generate a non-negligible amount of money. Um, I'm optimistic that the fee is not completely prohibitive and it might be about at the right level in order to build momentum and an organic uh, interest and user base. Yes, and I would assume there would be interest from people who are already prolific on social media, but they might perhaps think that the social media platforms do not reward them appropriately for their contributions and in some cases even try to censor their contributions. So in this situation, it would depend on the viewer engagement with what they're posting, but they could actually realize some rewards for promoting ideas that resonate with people. But you did mention that there is a risk of this space becoming utilized by propagandists of various stripes who might be trying to push ideas that are popular or appealing in some respects, but may not be exactly true. So how would you guard against that? What if Alex Jones were to try to use idea market, for instance, and spread a conspiracy theory, but a certain vocal segment, a minority of the population would resonate with that idea and they would flood the site. Would you have checks and balances available to prevent that? Well, part of the way we designed idea market the way we did, uh, and this sense of avoiding being authority to tell people what to think, but merely recording opinions in a permanent and transparent way, is that even if that were to happen, what you would end up with is an on-chain permanent immutable track record of what people believed and when. So if people end up being wrong about something, well, there's a permanent record of them being wrong about that thing. So nobody ends up really you know, paying a cost for that except for the person who ventured their opinion. And at the same time, if people go ahead and argue with them and then uh, you know, reality bears out and shows that they were right in the end, then those people um, do have you know, a benefit. They are in a database that says, hey, I believed this, I believed X at time T. And you'll be able, since these ratings are all on chain, they are all you know, queryable in a sense. It really is like a permanent database. So if someday you wanna say, hey, who believed X about Y at time T, you can you know, query that and it'll return a list. And if it's a really important topic at a really early date, it'll be really valuable to be on that list because people will be looking to you for insights about current problems that history hasn't yet had the chance to resolve. Yes, and Leah, you wrote that the best example of this is COVID in January 2020 before most people were talking about it. So how would this have worked with Idea Market? Well, just a quick explanation of that is if, if Idea Market had been live by then, um, the people on Twitter and across the internet who were saying like, hey, this thing is happening, we need to start wearing masks, we need to start stocking up on, on the things. Everybody was calling them crazy. I'm sure, I'm sure some of us were, were in that group. And 
everybody just didn't want to didn't want to think about that and so th in the way that i'm thinking about this people might have been voting it down and saying that's dumb that don't pay attention to that and then COVID hit and then lab leak information hit and then all of these things hit and then you'd be able to go back and say hey you you didn't believe early on you were saying this it's just um a very recent and clear example of what that track record would look like yes very interesting and i agree it would have been useful to have a platform during the early pandemic where people could honestly exchange information because there was censorship on the social media platforms and i will mention obvious instances of censorship for instance sometimes people who were advocating using masks when the surgeon general was saying don't buy masks were censored or people who uh, stated perhaps the virus originated in a lab leak rather than from animal to human transmission were considered conspiracy theorists and censored even though now joe biden is saying this is more probable than not so uh, i do by the way strongly advocate for freedom of expression, freedom of sharing information, whether or not it turns out to be true, suppressing it is highly counterproductive because then the question arises in a large segment of the population, what are they trying to hide? And it's important not to have that kind of impression, especially for true ideas and frameworks that are more likely to be correct than not. So with that, please proceed with anything else in the initial presentation that you would like to highlight. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to dive a little bit deeper. And in the sense of um, uh, public debate and making it more open and transparent and even useful is on the same page that you're looking at, which is an example of a post page, this is the post page for this post, Psychic Abilities Are Real, where you have the list of everybody's uh, responses and, the, and their citations. And what we've also done is arranged these cited posts into an argument tree. So on the left column, you see the top reasons in favor of Psychic Abilities Are Real or against. So the green are in favor and the red are against. And then in the middle column, you see the top reasons for and against those reasons. So every argument, every post has a place in an argument tree that branches out. So it's kind of like Wikipedia for arguments. It's a knowledge graph. And all the posts are on chain, all the citations are on chain. So not only will we be able to see what people believe and when, but also why. Does that make sense? Yes, actually, back in the middle of the first decade of the century, I was thinking if only people in their discussions with one another could craft argument trees and figure out exactly where they disagree along the chains of arguments and responses, what assumptions they share and what assumptions they differ on, then we could actually make intellectual progress. And this was interesting to me uh, as a bit of a personal background. I'm an atheist, but I attended a predominantly Christian college and I had a lot of arguments with people about religion and metaphysics and ethics. And I was wondering, well, isn't there actually more common ground than areas of difference than might seem at first glance. And if we could only narrow down those areas of difference, we could make real intellectual progress in terms of actually improving the world and figuring out areas for collaboration because these argument trees could enable us to figure out, well, there is this vast body of premises that we actually do agree on and those differences, they may not be as substantial as they might have seemed. But argument trees have not ubiquitously proliferated. This is not how Twitter works or how Facebook works these days. So uh, I'm intrigued by this. Now, uh, with regard to how the 
argument trees get formed, is it also the case that each node in the argument tree gets elevated based on how people rate that node? Yeah, it's that uh, they're actually ranked on the page by um, number of ratings from top users. That's what this hot statistic is down here. But that's really just a front end uh, user interface decision. There's nothing kind of inherent about that. It's just how we've done it for now. Um, but yes, these are ranked kind of by, you know, implied relevance based on who's rated it and who has cited it in favor of this particular post. Yes, very interesting. Now, along these lines, Jonathan Gunnell asks, have you considered how Kylo and IBM Project Debater do that kind of argument sorting? Yeah, Kialo was a huge uh, inspiration. They're awesome. They've been doing argument trees on Web2 for years. And uh, they're, they're amazing. Their UX is amazing. Um, so yeah, I've, I've taken a, a reasonable amount of inspiration from them and, and would kind of like to look as, as pretty and beautiful as, as they do. Um, IBM Project Debater, I haven't seen uh so much but kialo yeah i love what they're doing i just think um i i see a more um maybe leveraged use of that kind of technology than they're building on and also they started so much earlier that using web3 wasn't really an option for them using crypto and, and monetization and and permanent you know immutable blockchains probably wasn't really an option for them so, you know, uh, they have an eternal fan uh, out from me. Um, I'm just kind of taking it in a different direction and, and trying to play a different role with it. Yes, thank you. That is quite informative. Now, I'm wondering, this is a question that Jason posed, whether we could end up with a graph of a conspiracy theory, like let's say Alex Jones does start to use idea market and he says something like, uh, elephants are not real. I know there's a mock conspiracy theory saying birds are not real. So what if Alex Jones starts saying elephants are not real? They're uh, really giant Trojan horse-like creatures that are used by the CIA to spy on people in Africa. And he maps out this conspiracy theory uh, and people respond to it on idea market and provide a uh, common arguments against it, and maybe some of the diehard supporters of this theory uh, start making arguments in favor of it. Could we have a situation where we have an argument tree about the elephants aren't real conspiracy theory, and uh, people might figure out exactly where its weak points are? Yeah, I think that would be very healthy. I think that's kind of the perfect use for this. Um, it, I really, like, I made a blog post a while back. There's this meme of Oh, David Duchovny in some show. It wasn't X-Files. It was something where he's like got this conspiracy like crazy board up with all the yarn tying together news articles and stuff. And it's just like the textbook, you know, meme version of the conspiracy theorist that gets thrown around. And I, I put that at the top of this blog post to say, this is what we're building. We're building the, uh, the crazy net, crazy web for the internet, the, uh, the crazy board, the internet's crazy board. Because I think you know, blowing things out like that, letting them have their full, you know, anatomy examined is what not only will enable uh, cooler heads to prevail in, in the right cases, but also for people who believe things that are not as useful as other things um, to be persuaded and have, have point by point engagement. Um, another th benefit that we'd get with, you know, an Alex Jones conspiracy theory that blows out on idea market is you'll have uh, these permanent immutable lists of people who agree and disagree and how confidently and why. So that let's say maybe, you know, 1% of that is true. Maybe the CIA really is smuggling something and, you know, it, 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 he took that part of it and extrapolated it in the wrong direction. Um, you know, we'll be able to figure out um, much more quickly which aspects of a crazy web are actually legitimate and, and tie them together in, in a more coherent way and in a much faster iterating way 
than just these kind of churning, repeated conversations among the same people on Twitter um, that are isolated from the halls of power and the institutions of legitimacy. So I think that it would, it would be an extremely healthy thing to give conspiracy theorists uh, this voice that they've never had and also the sort of uh, demonstrably fair playing ground uh, that allows these things to be hashed out in full view of the public and with full respect for personal opinion so that we can see who believes what at what time and why and just let that conversation, which uh, hopefully would be in a fairer context than it's ever been, let that evolve naturally. Yes. And Dan wonders, could this save Twitter? And I'm thinking, given that Twitter is probably going to have the structure it has, maybe with some modifications by Elon Musk, where people do tend to just stew in the same sea of arguments and common assertions and not really have structured discussions. But could this still be beneficial for the Twitter space if people import the conclusions from idea market or provide links to idea market threads for the Twitter users to consider and maybe even join in and participate in the more structured discussions on idea market. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think idea market is what people naturally want to do anyway when they're having a conversation or argument. I think there's a lot more like intellectual honesty and actual interest in conversation and truth seeking than um, social media tends to allow or encourage. And just by organizing things in a, in a different way, it might facilitate conversations that the people are actually trying to have but just don't have the user interface for at, at the moment. So I would love to see a symbiotic relationship between Idea Market and Twitter. I did mention earlier that Idea Market is kind of the rails for a disruptive idea to become credible in the time it takes for a tweet to go viral. I meant that literally, because if Balaji Srinivasan or Naval Ravikant or Mark Andreessen or someone with clout like that takes an Idea Market post and tweets it out to his audience and says, hey, everybody rate this. Let's see how it stacks up. Um, that could literally be the case. Yes, indeed. Now, Jason wonders, with regard to the incentives of Idea Market, uh, could it have uh, some of the same deleterious incentives that social media have today? And Jason, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on your question a bit. What bad incentives in particular do you see on social media today? And uh, perhaps where do you see uh, some areas that idea market would need to address to prevent those same incentives? Um, well, you know how in social media, it, usually the posts that get a lot of attention are the ones that say something rather inflammatory. It gets a, an argument going. And then, so a lot of times it's the negative posts that get the most attention. And, and I'm wondering um, I'm hoping that there will be a way to tweak the incentives so that way, you know, using the Alex Jones metaphor there, you know, um, if he was to get on there, you know, uh, I mean, would he make a bunch of money? I mean, because it's, it seems like there's a possibility that the more inflammatory you make the post, the more chance somebody's going to, you know reply to it but then I, i'm just i really don't know how it would work out because somebody might go look you know if i know the fact that there's money on it and, and it costs that puts a whole new parameter on things i mean you know how you can't just troll forever if it costs you money every single time and then you're like you know i don't even like this guy why if i argue with him then he's you know I, why would I want to give him my money? <laughs> you know what I mean? So maybe there might be incentive not to reply to the idiot guy that you don't like or whatever. Uh, you know, um, I, I really like how you, how it's, how it's rated. There's a, a thing in AI um, called a, a GAN, G-A-N, Generative Adversarial Network. And this seems to act like it uh, in, in a certain way to where, 
uh, everybody can be a generator. They, anybody can post. And then anybody can be a discriminator. You know, uh, that's really fundamental principle that I used with designing my wisdom of the crowd group. And, uh, you know, there is a whole wisdom of the crowd phenomena thing that, you know, you could be taken, you know, that this may take advantage of, which I, another thing I find really interesting. Uh, I'm wondering when somebody writes a post, uh, can you see who who's also rated it i mean uh or are they anonymous is there a way see because there's a thing with group think that you know sometimes people in a crowd will have a tendency oh everybody else is voting this way i'll vote this way too so uh you know i'm not really sure what the question here is um, maybe um is, I got is, some stuff to jam on here. I hear you. Go, go ahead, you know, man. <laughs> <It's weird. laughs> go ahead. Yeah. So, um, uh, Mike Sin actually brought this up too about blinding, like blinding the respondents, so that people aren't so tempted to follow uh, big names and stuff like that, and just you know be influenced. Um, but I think it's not as big of a problem as. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a problem that's worth solving right now. And here's why. People are going to make uh, judgments about what they believe and what their opinions are among an infinite combination of conditions. People might rate something 10 points higher or lower because it's cloudy outside. And yeah, maybe we could hide, we could, you know, d do all the dev work to hide the list of people uh, so that people don't know and maybe that'll change their thing by 10 points. But it also removes the uh, credibility aspect. It makes the credibility aspect yeah. less visible because it makes you have to participate in order to see who believes what. And that's, that's the key point of, of the platform is to give people a quick way to go, hey, look, all these big shots say X. Um, so so I, I don't think I'm going to do that soon. Um, everything is on chain and open source. So if people want to build an alternate front end that does that, that would be fantastic. But I think it's, it's, it's not it's, always a problem. So, I mean, it's yeah. not necessarily. Oh, Jason, I think you're muted a little bit, my friend. Oops. I said, it's not, it's not always a problem. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, so, yeah, I, I I completely agree. I mean, you know, and the, that meritocracy element that you was just talking about being removed is probably a big a big plus, you know. Yeah. Um, you're also asking a little bit about uh, anonymity. Uh, just to be clear, the user account is a crypto wallet. So to the you have the ability to fill in a username like I have, Harmony Lion, and a picture and stuff like that. Um, but the user accounts are generated one per crypto wallet. So if you want to be anonymous, you just have to create a new crypto wallet and keep it separate from your identifiable information, which in the crypto world is harder than it sounds. Um, but yes, so there's there's the anonymity just in to whatever extent people feel like uh, keeping a crypto wallet uh, isolated and anonymous. So tell us a bit more about the user's profile and what information can be derived from it. Sure. So we give every user a profile that kind of collects all their opinions in one place. So if you want to know what I think about everything, you can go to ideamarket.io slash u slash Harmony Lion. And these are all my ratings. Shmoji said pain and suffering should be minimized as much as possible. I 75% agree. And here's why. Idea market said God exists. I 100% agree. Here's why. Several reasons. So you can just kind of see everyone's opinions and you can sort them by confidence, um, like how high or low the opinion is. It's taking a little second to load, but that just might be because there's lag. Um, but um, yeah, so the, the idea market profile kind of automatically assembles all of your activity into one place so that people can 
make friends with each other. And speaking of that, we have this similar users tab that's starting to experiment with the analytics layer of Idea Market. And what this does is it automatically takes all the posts that people have rated in common and shows you to what extent they agree. So Explorator and I have rated 60 of the same posts and we tend to differ by 27 points, 73% match. So you can kind of use this to see who agrees with you about everything. And then you can go to their profile and you know, find their Twitter account and reach out. Um, so this is just you know, a very basic demo level use of the data that Idea Market creates. But one of the things I'm most excited about here is the analytics layer in that respect. Um, you mentioned earlier, you know, going to an atheist or being an atheist and going to a Christian college. Well, Idea Market would let you kind of programmatically isolate what you and Christians believe in common. You could say, you know, I, I believe this. Who else agrees? Or um, there's this group of people and that group of people. What do they most uh, commonly agree on? And things like that. So the open source permanent username tied on chain ratings. It just, it really excites me uh, how many sort of filters and correlations can be applied to that to um, understand better what people really believe and, and for niche philosophical tribes to discover each other. Yes, indeed. So Jonathan Ganell wonders, could you make things anonymous until you post on a thread to prevent bandwagoning and party line forming? So to what extent would a user have the ability to remain anonymous to uh, a certain degree or another, whether that be through the profile not being revealed to others or by some other means, like some sort of shadow mode that people might be able to trigger? Yeah, I'm. This kind of goes along with uh, what I was responding to uh, J of Jason's question earlier, and what I'm hoping is the case is that whether people bandwagon doesn't really matter because people are going to do what's in what it's in their nature to do. What ultimately matters is what's their opinion at the end of the day, because that's the data that's going to be sorted for. We can't really prevent bandwagoning when people are making decisions in the public square on Twitter and the New York Times and government. Like there's no IRL meat space way to prevent humans from doing human nature. So given that we can't isolate those conditions out in the real world, but we're still trying to get the best, find, figure out who has the best judgment, um, it doesn't seem like it would add incredibly much to prevent, to artificially prevent bandwagoning in this specific context. Uh, because when we're trying to figure out who has the best judgment, it doesn't matter if you have the best judgment as long as there's no bandwagoning. What matters is how good is your judgment when there's bandwagoning? Because the rest of the world still has bandwagoning in it. Does that yes. make sense? Yes, it does. And of course, we experience the phenomenon of bandwagoning regularly. And I know as the chairman of a minor political party, how tempting it is sometimes for people to side with major political parties on issues of the day, especially because major political parties put out a lot of propaganda. They devote millions, if not billions of dollars to pushing a particular narrative. And I have to be quite resolute in telling people we need to stay objective. We can't just fall for a particular party's narrative. We need to consider the issue on its own merits. And that's hard to do when even a lot of our members might be swayed by propaganda of the moment. And then in a few months, they will kind of come out of the spell of that propaganda and be able to take a few steps back, analyze the issue objectively. So yes, that kind of fortitude and resolve to be objective in the face of a lot of external bandwagoning is quite important. And I'm intrigued by structures that would support that. Now, our friend Dan Tweed uh, writes, people don't really believe that the internet is a permanent record and this might help to teach them. I wonder 
uh, to what extent also this platform might be conducive to people's intellectual evolution. Like if they are on record advocating a particular idea uh, in the past, but their thinking has evolved, would this incentivize them to accept that to a greater extent rather than to be uh, very much committed to prior positions simply because they're on the record expressing those positions? I think it would. I suspect it would because you can rate the same posts an infinite number of times. Yet the ratings are all permanent and on-chain, but that doesn't mean you can't re-rate. So if you do change your mind, you can put your new opinion on-chain as well and the track record will be on-chain. So uh, yes, there's nothing really gained. Um, there's, I would expect that there's nothing really gained from being stubborn even in the face of one's own conversion. Um, and you know what I'm hoping idea market models is what we're all naturally trying to do anyway. And to, to capture that evolution in a way that can be sliced and diced with data and referred to and allow people to more effectively allocate their trust between people who deserve it and not just people who have big credentials uh, is you know, what the end game is here. Yes, very good. And Dan, yeah. oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, Dan also wonders, can you use the data from Idea Market in time-based infographics as well? Yeah, I love that idea. And yes, our goal is, is for all this information to be open source. It is. It's all on chain. And I am I'm basically most excited for all the analytics layers and visualizations that will explode out of this. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to a belief weather map, an opinion weather map, where we can see what the most popular ideas are, who the most influential people are, what the most popular reasons for those ideas are, and how that evolves over time. I'm imagining something that looks kind of like, uh, like Google Maps, like a traffic map, where you can see, instead of cities connected by highways, you see posts connected by citations. And maybe a green line will be in favor of this idea because that idea. And maybe it'll be thicker if more people agree. And maybe it'll be darker if uh, a higher percentage of top users agree or something like that. So I'm very much looking forward to the kind of uh, the ecosystem of visualizations that could come from people playing with this data in different ways. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that. Yes, yes, indeed. So Jason, you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I, I would love it if there would be a system where we, you know, you get rewarded for being correct and where truth gets rewarded and, you know, untruth uh, is, is incentivized not, you know, to, you know, that, that would be awesome. I, you know, um, all the disinformation, I would love to have a system that just sort of ag uh, organically filters that out, you know, and you, there's incentive, literally monetary incentive to be more correct. You know, I, I'd love it if there was even possibly incentive to you know, for just being nice <laughs> or something, maybe, uh, eventually down the road, maybe there's emojis and, you know, if, if somebody gets a laughy face or something that means something in, in a monetary sense. And if that was the case, I'm sure that, you know, how people will, uh, if they don't agree with you on Facebook, they'll put a laughy face like they're, you know, they think what you just said was stupid or something. I'm guessing that people wouldn't do that if they had to pay money to, to do that. I don't know. Uh, but it would just be awesome if it was built in and just the good ideas rise to the top, the, the more trustworthy things rise to the top. And so I'm really looking forward to what this could possibly be. You know, I, I always look at things, not necessarily what they are right now, but what they could be. And this has tons of potential, tons of potential. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I love that idea as well. Like I, I want to, you know, one of the things that really drew me to the crypto world was the way people were building incentive mechanisms that had a very specific effect. And that effect is aligning personal interest with public benefit so that we don't have to fight human nature. We don't have to persuade anybody. We just let people do what they want and is good for them. And then the secondary effects of that uh, end up being good for everyone else too. So that's kind of one of the ideas that, um, that got me started thinking about idea market and thinking about that in terms of uh, information ranking, information credibility and stuff like that. And in terms of uh, directly rewarding people, uh, that's definitely something that I want to enable. And I'm, I'm thinking of that evolving like an ecosystem too, in a, in a similar way to the analytics where instead of kind of legislating and deciding who's right, we let the community develop tools to interact with people that they trust. And one of the, one of the most obvious ones, uh, one of my favorite ones is this idea of a persuasion market and a persuasion market, which is a term that came to me about 17 seconds ago. Well, while we were talking about this is a prediction market that uses personal opinions as the Oracle. So a persuasion might look like here are 10 idea market users. I bet they will rate broccoli cures cancer above 90 by January 1st, 2024. And you can bet on that. That does not require some scientific body to officially adjudicate, yes, broccoli cures cancer. It does not require a sensor to measure with you know, uh, computationally perfect data capturing that broccoli cures cancer. It just requires these 10 people to, on average, be pretty darn confident that broccoli cures cancer. And so um, the the prediction markets that can spin out of, out of this, especially for the people who earn a lot of trust on idea market, they will be in demand adjudicators of such markets. And it would probably be in uh, the interest of whoever builds this tool, be it us or somebody else, to reward the people who are honored with the privilege of adjudicating. Very interesting. Now we have a series of related questions Mike Lazine wonders, so is truth always based on data? And Dan Tweed writes, can we leave fact-checking up to consensus reality? I'm thinking in connection with these questions of an example where someone has really deep scientific expertise, like in nuclear physics, for example. And there may be popular opinions about nuclear physics that aren't quite correct. So maybe some people think nuclear power plants are more prone to meltdowns than they are. And the nuclear physicist is on idea market trying to explain why that's not the case, why there are various safety precautions, but his explanation is over most people's heads. So could there be a situation where he's actually correct, but he's not rated as highly because people don't understand the exact explanation that he is providing and don't see it as compelling as it actually is. Um, certainly that's, that's likely to be the case uh, because specialists, specialists having the right knowledge and then translating that knowledge into public knowledge are two very different problems. And idea market does aim to be a, you know, a vector for, for that transmission where the best knowledge becomes the public knowledge. Um, but there's, you know, there is a persuasion element and a trust earning element involved. And given that that's going to be there, whether idea market exists or not, um, we are at least, you know, building a tool that hopefully makes it easier for that bridge to be, for that gap to be bridged. Um, there were a couple other questions that you brought up at the beginning of that segment that I wanted to address. Would you mind just refreshing my memory what those two were? Yes. Uh, so... Mike Lazine wonders, is truth always based on data? And Dan Tweed asks, can we leave fact checking up to consensus reality? Gotcha. Okay. So I, I believe something close to the opposite of truth always being based on data. Um, we, can, we can measure things and those are, those are useful. Um, but the truth is, uh, truth is a mysterious thing that I will not you know, try to inherently define. 
But one thing that we're kind of bound to in this life is uncertainty. That even when we have wonderful data about a thing, we cannot help but make personal decisions about whether it's sufficient. That when, um, you know, when a thermometer says it's 95 degrees outside, even when you have a consensus of 5,000 thermometers that say it's 95 degrees outside, you reserve the right as a human being to say, no, I'm not sure enough. I'm going to be betting $100 million on this. I really want 5,001 thermometers. And so ultimately, um, what we decide to accept as fact is an amalgamation of things that are all in some way or another personal opinion. There are trust. Do we trust the party that's giving us this information? Do we trust the sensor that's giving this information? Um, they are uh, the you know level of action that has to be taken. Are we going to be betting a lot on this or does it not really matter? Is it safe to write off the uh, uncertainty that has not been addressed? And you know there's there's always the possibility that we're all dreaming right now. And so in, in any in the assessment of any fact, there's not really a way to arrive at a perfect you know representation of a set of circumstances that then we you know promulgate around the world. Um, the the you know the psychological realities that trust and uncertainty are more fundamental. So in order to to kind of address the second question a bit more thoroughly here, um, can fact checking be left up to you know consensus reality? I think of it more as redefining the problem from fact checking to trust allocation. The problem isn't uh, what's true with certainty because uh, there's not really such thing, at least collectively, especially collectively. Certainty, uh, in my experience, is, is an emotion or a decision. I feel certain about this, or I decide that I'm sure enough to call myself certain about this. But other people may feel very differently, and even if I'm certain and correct, you might have lots of reasons not to believe me, and there's nothing I can do about that. So public certainty about any particular thing uh, is kind of an impossible goal to strive for. And one of Idea Market's kind of uh, foundational things is redefining the problem in that way from the uh, seeking and then the manufacture and distribution of certainty, which is the kind of fact-checking model, to trust allocation. Given that what we consider true is ultimately comes down to personal opinion on some level, the problem to solve is not what is the certainty and then spread it, but who do we trust to decide which uncertainties to ignore? Who do we trust to decide which almost certainties are worth betting on? Because right now, um, the institutions that we trust to provide these uh, kinds of impressions of certainty are doing a relatively terrible job, even compared to amateurs. And this has uh, become transparent to the public now, and there's no going back from that. So um, to the extent that we can solve the trust allocation problem and have the largest numbers of people putting their trust in the individuals who most deserve it will do the greatest good for finding consensus around things that are actually true and iterating the allocation of that trust at the speed at which it is broken, instead of having the same institutions give us bad information decade after decade. Very interesting. Now, Ben Balweg wonders with regard to the ability to rate an idea positively or negatively more than once, does this give a person who really favors or disfavors a particular idea and has money to burn a potential disproportionate share of influence. Like let's say this person is a newly minted crypto multimillionaire and he has a pet idea. Uh, for instance, green elephants are real. That's his pet idea. And what he really wants is a project to be funded where he gets to search for green elephants and he gets his expenses paid for. And he has enough money, he thinks, perhaps putting in $100,000 worth of Ethereum to elevate this idea to the top will give it enough credibility that some institution will give him more than $100,000 in funding for his search. 
So could he do that? Or would there be some mechanisms and idea market to limit the share of influence that this one individual could have? Yeah, I don't think it would work very well. And the reason is, um, no matter how much money I spend to elevate an idea on idea market, there's not really an amount of money that I can spend to convince all the individuals who I would want socially signaling in favor of it to do that. So he could spend $100,000 making sure his post is at the top of idea market, but that's not going to make Elon Musk approve. That's not going to make all the people who respond to it like it. And so um, I think just the fact that individuals are so much harder to capture um, because they each have their own, you know, integrity makes makes that you know very very difficult to be persuasive yes you can get more visibility no i don't think you could get more influence or more social clout um without earning it in people's honest perception very interesting so uh ben do you have any reaction to this Um, no, I'm, I'm, that makes sense to me that you could theoretically mm, like stuff your own ballot box, but everybody would see, oh, he just voted himself up a bazillion times. So yeah, that, that, that clarifies. Thank you. Yes. And Leah, you pointed this out as well, that idea market would show who rated a particular post. So people might ignore a post if one individual just upvoted it a hundred times. Very interesting. And I can definitely see how that would be a limitation on the effectiveness of that tactic. Uh, would you like to say anything else in this regard? No, I feel it's been pretty well covered. Thank you. Okay, Ryan. great, great. So now I think I would like to uh, offer you the opportunity to uh, show us anything else about Idea Market in terms of the features of the site that you wanted to highlight. Sure. Um, I did want to mention in addition that every post is an NFT. That's just, you know, people are talking about NFTs as these big collectible trendy things. I don't really like that uh, attitude. I see it as a technical uh, building block. I'm not a super technical person, but I, I see the NFT framework as a useful building block to achieve certain technical ends. And that's how we're using it in this case. And uh, what we're able to do with that is every post is an NFT. So when I rate Shmoji's post, for example, it sends a dollar fifty or so, a thousandth of an ETH to his little available to withdraw button up in the upper right corner here. But if he sells that NFT to someone else, then they get all the uh, rating fees that accrue afterward. Um, so, for example, if uh, if a big influencer wants to buy your post and then spread it to his audience, he could just you know pay you $1,000 for your post or something like that and then get all the rating fees that he gets from his audience. Um, and that has implications for the argument tree because the posts that get cit cited most often and among the most you know, frequent or prominent conversations will keep being visible and keep earning ratings. And so they'll keep earning money in theory. So it's kind of like owning a, a, a well-referenced post NFT and idea market is kind of like owning land in a public conversation. And if you know people want to express their opinion on that little piece of land, you're the one who gets the money for it. So um, this is not necessarily an inherently necessary part of the public epistemology of the future, but it kind of makes things, uh, makes things interesting a bit too. Does that make sense? Yes. So the NFT aspect would transform each of these arguments into digital real estate, in essence, that could be transferred to another individual if one wanted to transfer the revenue stream for whatever reason. And Dan Tweed suggests the first instance of a popular post might acquire collector value. As exactly. That's an interesting yes, co collector value and also value from rating fees if it continues to uh, earn ratings. Like there could actually be, you know, if if an idea market post is revisited over and over like some tweets are, um, 
and you own that for five years and the debate, you know, keeps raging on and new people sign up. And so new blood comes in. Uh, yeah, it, it could be, it could be an interesting, you know, I hesitate to say income stream, but, um, profit source, let's say. Yes. And I have certainly had certain content of mine over the years that has generated that kind of continued interest and sometimes controversy that people kept revisiting year after year. So that would be nice to have something beyond YouTube advertising revenue to uh, essentially reflect the contribution of that post to the discussion. Now, it's interesting also uh, that there might be some sort of integration with data from Fitbit or CureDAO. We had a virtual enlightenment salon with the founders of CureDAO in August. So could you discuss that a bit? Yeah. yeah how, my... How'd you get Mike meet and, and all that stuff? Let's, yeah. Sure. Um, Tristan, I believe the last name is Harris. Tristan introduced us. Uh, he's a, uh, you know, kind of a connecting figure in the decentralized science world that's uh, using Web3 tools for science and, and making scientific research more uh, accessible and crowdsourceable. And I feel like there's a, a happy synergy with Idea Market because one of the biggest pain points for decentralized science is, all right, we've made these discoveries, but how do we get them to the FDA? How do we turn them into something useful? How do we get the public to benefit from this information, which only we have? And so uh, what I'm hoping Idea Market can, can play a role for them there is when they make a discovery, when a DSI DAO has a finding that they want to share and inject into the public conversation, that Idea Market could be a tool for that. And instead of needing to uh, monetize by selling intellectual property or developing a drug or raising money from an investor or getting institutional support from the FDA or some giant pharmaceutical company. They can instead post their findings on idea market and get credible people to rate the posts and kind of bootstrap the legitimacy and impact of the research that they've done. And in addition, collect rating fees from any member of the general public who would rate their post. So I'm hoping that idea market can kind of be the space elevator from discovery to legitimacy, as well as an income stream for scientific research itself without requiring these extra levels of uh, involvement and investment. Very interesting. Now, would you say that there are certain kinds of ideas or uh, propositions that might not be amenable to the structure. So uh, for instance, Mike Lazine suggested there could be like a personal experience if something happened to you earlier in your life, uh, then you experienced it, somebody else didn't, so they wouldn't really have uh, that much input to provide. So would you say that idea market is more useful for propositions that could be more universally responded to. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you've had that particular experience or not, uh, whereas there are others, just facts of your life or uh, other kinds of facts that are demonstrably clear to some people, but others wouldn't really have any access to them that wouldn't be a good fit for this platform. Yeah, that is my guess. My guess is that these kinds of atomic statements that can be easily uh, linked together and rated independently of one another as well uh, would do the best. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, at the, in the same way that people on Twitter are constantly discovering new ways to go viral, the platform kind of has an invisible in, uh, incentive structure that's not really discovered until it's discovered and will you know, naturally evolve based on the culture and how people end up using it. So on one end, yes, I do believe that certain kinds of posts and certain kinds of content will do better than others. On the other hand, it's, it's really just a, a hypothesis at this point. Um, one thing I can say with uh, a little more confidence is that people tend to be used to conversations that are disposable. 
people tend to be used to having the same conversation over and over with different people at different times on Twitter or whatever, or Facebook. And in doing that, people get used to a conversational style that is disposable. For example, on this post that I'm, you know, happen to be demoing right now, you know, I made this post in the citations. I made this citation of my opinion on pain and suffering should be minimized. Voluntary suffering in the short term can prevent involuntary suffering in the long term, blah, blah, blah. And someone replied, that's deep. Well, the problem is that's deep is a post all its own. And without a referent, there's not really a good reason to rate this post because it just says that's deep. Um, so every, every post it stands on its own. It's only cited as a secondary you know, effect of it. There's not like a thread where people can look at that's deep and say, oh, what's that responding to? You know, so I think, um, and, and, and also there's not really a lot of value in, in spending a dollar fifty to agree or disagree on the concept of that's deep. Like what would that even mean to agree with that's deep without any referent to, to it? So um, I do think that there are certain conversational habits that uh, are comfortable in disposable conversations that would be less profitable, less useful on idea market. But um, it, there's a, a $1.50 fee per post. So if people decide to ignore that, it just helps our treasury. So I don't mind too incredibly much. Ah, uh, I see. So, so it, 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 it's cost for both the rating and, and, and for the post? Or... Yes. So I, if I make a post, it costs about $1.50. And then if you rate it, it costs you $1.50, which you pay to me. So if I pay that first $1.50 or so, to make a post and then two or three people rate it, I'm in the green. Yes, very interesting. So it seems that a given post could potentially be cited as a response to multiple conversations. If it's not, that's deep, but if it is something substantive that could be a response to one statement, but it could also be a response to a different statement, you could find it in multiple argument trees. That is, that is precisely the intent and that's what I'm hoping to visualize someday on a uh, highway highway map kind of style. You know, Washington, D.C. doesn't only connect to New York. It also connects to Philadelphia. It also connects to Raleigh. And you have these different, uh, you know, roads and inference channels happening. And uh, so, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's why it uh, will hopefully be interesting to own, own land in a conversation on idea market someday. Yes, indeed. So Jonathan Ganell wonders, have you read Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions? It's a work that gives great insight into how things change. And if we in a discipline or in a society experience one of Kuhn's paradigm shifts, then people come to realize that most of the ideas from the previous paradigm are incorrect. Of course, that's Kuhn's framework, and it is different from another interpretation, which is that knowledge is more cumulative and one builds upon prior eras, uh, prior periods of history, but doesn't necessarily reject them wholesale. So where do you stand on this, and how would idea market play into uh, that kind of framework? Sure. So idea market is kind of paradigm agnostic and I, it's been a long time since I've read Kuhn. So thank you for summarizing a little bit. Um, but uh, yes, it seems like it's kind of been a long time since there've been a major scientific paradigm shift. And I also suspect that given the uh, internet makes available all of the world's information, basically the history of the whole world's information. And yet, in the 30 years that we've had the internet, um, there hasn't been a major scientific revolution. I find this to be an odd, an odd outcome. I'm not that confident that our institutions really have the best knowledge and the best metaphors and the best paradigms. So what I'm hoping idea market will do is open up a, uh, a level playing field for paradigms to compete on the basis of their merits instead of on the basis of institutional uh, inertia. Um, so I do expect that if disruptive information can be made credible in the time that it takes for a tweet to go viral, that scientific paradigm shifts will happen a lot more frequently and possibly be even 
a continuous or rolling uh, thing. So in terms of distribution of, of disruptive information, I really think that this could hockey stick the rate of scientific discovery. And I think that there are some dangers in that too. That's not necessarily all good. But if indeed there have been cancer cures where the you know, discoverer has been mysteriously killed an hour before his big lecture, which has happened like a bunch of times is from what I can tell, uh, if there's any legitimacy to any of those things, then you know, maybe cancer can go away in three or four years. Um, and you know, this, these, basically the idea market's thesis is that the gap, or one of them, is that the gap between the world's best information and common knowledge is devastatingly wide uh, for no reason. And it's uh, the distance of that gap is truly tragic. The amount of preventable suffering and, and preventable deception um, that happens when there's not really a technological reason for it anymore. It's really just a social, a social reason that our trust is misplaced. And uh, that idea market is, is trying to build tools that make it easier to close that gap. Um, cause right now we're just, we're starving in the supermarket. And I think a lot of people on Twitter would agree. And I'm sure a lot of you would agree that, you know, being experts in various fields, what you see in, in the mainstream press about your fields is nowhere near what you would write if you were them. Um, so, you know, in that, I like that starving in the supermarket metaphor, because we really have this infinite array of incredibly wonderful informational nourishment and low hanging fruit to choose from. And all the cameras and lights are pointed at the little empty cardboard box in the corner with flies zipping around. And just because that's how we've always done it or because it benefits you know, the owners of those institutions or whatever conspiracy theory is, is your flavor. Um, yeah, I, Idea Market, I, I hope will uh, open up, open up a, a venue for letting information, public information evolve on its merits and at the rate that it naturally would if it were not impeded by such institutions. Yes, and I know from areas where I have domain expertise or a lot of knowledge of the events that transpired, mainstream media coverage can often be misleading or selective or designed to fit a preconceived narrative. And yet, because the mainstream media still have the most distribution and they have been aided by the recent social media censorship, protocols to maintain their dominance. What most people receive in terms of the information is at the most uh, pale shadow of the actual truth. So uh, I'm not intending, by the way, to say that this reflects any particular partisan position or another. The reality is a lot more nuanced than that. But generally speaking, if large segments of the media uh, become a propaganda arm for a large partic uh, particular political party, it could be the Democrats or the Republicans, then the information one hears from those sources will be partial at best. So I do appreciate the ability to have mechanisms to allow other perspectives to rise to the forefront and be considered. Now, Jason was wondering about the potential for a platform like this for creative collaborations like artistic or musical collaborations. Do you think there's a place for that on Idea Market? I have, and Jason mentioned this to me a couple of days ago, and I've, I've just only begun to, you know, start thinking about that kind of use case. And I think I see what what is meant with the, the like using the ar argument tree for versioning or for referencing um, earlier work and influences and things like that. And you know the NFT format would be good for tracking all of that. But it's a it's a it's a world that I I've just barely you know begun to explore. And I would, I would love for there to be a use case like that. And at the same time, I have to admit that my brain is too small to explode that into the ecosystem that it could be, uh, you know, while also trying to uh, achieve our core mission. So, you know, if I, we'll, we'll need help. We'll need help expanding that department.
<laughs> yeah, I, I it's it's above me too, but I I just seem kind of the that incentive structure seemed like it it would be really good for collaborating on because then if I fork off your stuff, like if it starts out with a drum beat or something, and then somebody comes along, takes that drum beat and puts a rhythm on it, you know, then they it, it links to that, and then if somebody takes that and forks off two different ways, you know, and then, so you want people to use your stuff. You know, it's like, here, I made this, you know, guitar riff. Please, somebody use it, make stuff out of it. And then you get, you would, uh, I, I'm curious if, if two people, like if if somebody has the way you're you have it now if somebody makes a post and then somebody posts off that and then like two people post off this other guy does the first guy still get paid or does he only get paid that one time from the next thing over so um <laughs> yeah the, the payments don't you know translate through citations uh, the way we have it built. I mean, I can imagine a universe in the future where something gets added to that, but it's not it's not in, immediately in, in the cards. Um, so yeah, there wouldn't be like a royalties going down multiple levels of citations or anything like that. But yes, um, if, if I rate your post, you get money. If I cite your post and then someone rates my money, no, you don't get, rates my post, then no, you don't get money. Um, but I love the idea of being able to like track you could like if you post, you know, post, you know, all along the watchtower, and then you'd see all the all the um, covers of it, and then you'd have different ratings so that people would be able to crowdsource. All right, what are the best covers? Best covers according to whom? And then you fork out and do all right, watchtower featuring Sean Penn, watchtower featuring, uh, you know, Shia LaBeouf or like whatever. And I know I think it would be a really cool thing to in, insert into a like a creative ecosystem. I think that's actually a, a really sweet use case. And I, I also thought, you know how sometimes with a lot of bands, they'll get together and maybe they don't have a vocalist or something. And what ends up happening is the drums will start playing and then the, the bass guys and then the guitar. And then they end up just like jamming for an hour, you know, and it's they're just a jam band, they call it, where they don't really play songs. They just get together and jam stuff. You could probably even do that with this. Somebody could just jam their thing along with it and it could end up where there is no vocals it's not really a song song but it could still be something cool i've listened to lots of bands just sit there and jam stuff and it's not a song but it was cool uh that could be something for this that would be neat i like it <laughs> but i'd love to see that happen I'd love to see that happen yes and leah wrote that technically the platform could be used that way, and if people use it, then it works even if it's not marketed that way. So I suppose that's an invitation for people to explore particular use cases and see if they catch on on Idea Market. Now, as a more general question, I'm curious, when did you first launch Idea Market and how has it been growing in your impression? Sure. Um, it's We've been through many stages of iteration. It started as a Medium article that I wrote in early 2019, I want to say. And I don't come from a technical background, so I had no intention of building it myself. I just thought, I'm, I think this is cool. I'm going to write it up and have someone steal it. And it actually looked back very different back then. It was a totally different you know, approach to solving the same problem. And uh, what happened was um, Eric Torenberg liked it and reached out and invited me on his uh, Village Global podcast. Uh, Eric Torenberg is the founder of On Deck, or one of them. And, uh, and then later that summer, Balaji Srinivasan also appreciated the article and tweeted about it. And, you know, just being the kind of guy who feeds on approval like that, it really lit a fire under my butt. And I put up some personal money to build a prototype and um, it just kind of evolved. It was a garage band thing that I did on the side. And um, when COVID hit, 
you know, for the um, startup I was working for at the time, I would go to a lot of conferences because I was the biz dev guy. So when COVID hit, it uh, it shut down my biz dev gig. So I, you know, parted ways with that uh, job and decided, hey, it must be time to go go in full time on Idea Market. So we started raising money, um, and I had miraculous good fortune in finding a smart contract developer. It just turned out to be an incredible whiz who won three of the largest Ethereum bug bounties in Ethereum history after I had hired him. And uh, our initial launch was in February, 2021. And on the first day we had over a million dollars in volume and that earned us some uh, natural, some organic press coverage. We got covered in Vice and NASDAQ and Yahoo and it was just a, a wonderful first day. And so we raised, you know, some more VC off the back of that and have just been iterating ever since. And it turned out that that version of the product was just much more difficult to make work than the one that you see before you now. Um, so we pivoted it in uh, May, or, May or June, we started building this and then launched it on September 1st. So what you see on ideamarket.io is about two and a half, three months old. Uh, pretty brand new, and uh, I'm really excited about how it's working and how it's feeling. So do you believe this version has more potential for so-called organic growth for being scaled up than your prior attempts? Yeah, absolutely. One of the big strengths is that there's not really any financial risk involved. Like there's no situation where someone will have millions of dollars riding on something that happens on idea market. Uh, today, whereas with our first product, we were trying to build kind of like a NASDAQ for credibility thing. We were trying to build an asset class and, you know, there's a lot of money tied up in asset classes and it's really hard to start a new asset class from scratch, I found out. And uh, after that kind of didn't work incredibly well, nobody, nobody lost money. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. But, um, after, after thinking about it, it was, uh, yeah, you know, even if this goes really well. I'm responsible in some way for the billions of dollars that are floating around on this thing. And uh, uh, it's, it's not reasonable to assume that we'll get it right on the first try and then never have to fix anything or anything like that. So we wanted to start over from a perspective that didn't actually require capital at risk in order to use idea market. And this is the implementation that, uh, was actually a side feature that I've want, been wanting to do for a long time. So we made it the main feature and uh, it's been wonderful. Yes, and I think this is quite prudent not to have capital at risk in growing or scaling a startup because I see that as the mistake that most startup founders make. They have a finite amount of runway, so to speak, to deal with. And then their idea might be a good idea, but it might take more time to scale up than they anticipate. They run out of the initial funding, can't raise more funding, and they have to fold. So if instead the funding that you get is proportional to your growth and you don't have to have a large initial investment, that's a much more sustainable model and the time frame is a lot more flexible as well. So I like this concept quite a bit. I am curious, because of the cryptocurrency base behind it, particularly Ethereum, how has the recent turmoil in the crypto markets affected idea market? Or do you think that there is some degree of insulation from that, from the specific dollar market price of a cryptocurrency like Ethereum. Yeah, um, frankly, we've been pretty untouched by it in the short term because all of the turmoil was happening on you know centralized platforms and platforms that dealt with currencies that were not Ethereum. Uh, we, you know, we've all we've thought for a long time that Ethereum has kind of won the blockchain protocol wars, and so we wanted to fully commit to that ecosystem. Uh, because it's just you know the most mature uh, by considerable margin. So if you know if Solana has problems, which is uh, the kind of FTX launched layer one blockchain, it doesn't doesn't affect us. If Bitcoin fluctuates, it doesn't really affect us. And generally, 
given that the payments all happen in Ethereum uh, and they tend to be between uh, crypto comfortable users in the first place, no one really expects Ethereum's price to be very low for very long. Uh, it, it's just a very uh, a relatively trusted, you know, between Ethereum and Bitcoin, one of the most trusted cryptocurrencies in the world. So it hasn't hasn't really affected us negatively in any way. And in fact, I expect that the medium and long term effects will be very positive for us because the more crypto activity is concentrated on fewer layer one blockchains like Ethereum, um, instead of spread between Ethereum and Solana, for example, uh, the more users will likely to have. Yes, and it does seem like Ethereum has been more stable than various other cryptocurrencies. It did have a spike in late 2021, but I am more used to it being around $1,000. Uh, that has <laughs> been more of my historical experience with Ethereum. And I think Vitalik Buterin is a much more trustworthy individual than many yeah. in the crypto space. He is also a life Bankman extension Freed. supporter. Bankman Freed that ran off the Bahamas or whatever he did with FTX. Yes. Uh. So Bankman Freed, by the way, was a political darling of the Democratic Party, and he engaged in massive amounts of uh, political yeah. campaign financing to the try to ingratiate Democrats. Him. Saying saying that he wanted regulation when all the while he really didn't want regulation. He wanted regulation of his competitors, as <laughs> do a lot of people who advocate for <laughs> regulation in this space. Yeah. And, and that that's another good point, actually. That you know, another potential upside for us is that anytime there's a giant breach of trust, there's an outcry for systems that improve trust, improve allocation of trust. And that's that's our, our core mission is, is trust allocation. So anytime something you know very dramatic and important happens and everyone goes, who predicted this? Uh, that's good for us. And anytime there's a big breach of trust and everyone goes, if only we could know who to trust, that's good for us. So kind of the failures of today's institutions are advertisements for idea market. Yes, yes, indeed. So now I wanted to give each of our panelists the opportunity to ask any remaining questions they have about idea market before we pivot into some other topics. So Jason, please go ahead. I got a, yeah, I got a quick one. Um, it almost seems like uh, I wonder how, how much incentive there would really be to rate people's stuff because I, I almost wonder if maybe uh, it would be if there was also a token Besides, well, I guess the NFT is a token, but maybe not a token, but just like a, you know, um, a badge or, or some kind of reward that you get that doesn't really mean or, or isn't really valuable above, you know, just, a, you know, bragging rights or, or something like that uh, to, to make it to where um, there's incentive to, to rate things and possibly even be nice if there was a mechanism of course then again you i have to back up i was gonna say if you got it right but then you know what's right it's all op opinion you know so um i i'm have you had a problem with uh people not i mean if it like I'm wondering why would I rate something when I could just make my own post or something? And then, I don't know. I guess yeah. we don't know until we really experiment with it, right? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And I, I, I am looking for ways to make rating more obviously worth it. But there's a universe of uh, downstream benefits that come from rating a post uh, from particularly the analytics layer. Um, for example... There's the uh, there's this practice of airdrops that when new crypto projects start or new communities start or new NFTs start, they'll often look for like early fans to give a free token to or a free NFT to or something like that to help to try to win their support and win their involvement. And one of the problems is if you give your airdrop away to too many people, 
a lot of them won't actually care about what you're doing and they'll just sell it and it'll crash the price of, you know, whatever you're doing and it'll make you look bad. So what airdrop projects do to counteract that is they use on-chain data to find the people who are most likely to care. And there have never been right, right now you can only really do that with financial data. All right. Only give my token to whales, people who have over a hundred ETH in their wallet. All right, only give my token to uh, board ape holders, people who have a board ape NFT. There are these very primitive ways of filtering wallets. But idea market means you can filter wallets based on their personal opinions, and not only based on their personal opinions, but combinations of their personal opinions. So if you have uh, you know, a DAO or a project that you're starting, and you only want to airdrop tokens to people who are Christian and believe Joe Biden is a hologram, before January 1st, 2024, you can you know, apply those filters and, and segregate those wallets and you can airdrop your token to these people who believe in you. And all those people do get a financial uh, you know, benefit from that uh, potentially. So when, when rating a post, particularly posts that a lot of other people have rated and are therefore more likely to be used as filters, um, you put your uh, opinion out there to be selected for and targeted so that when people try to find you to give you money, they can succeed more easily. Does that make sense? That's, that's one of the uses here of the analytics layer. Yes, indeed. Now, Leah, you mentioned previously in the chat that there could be a use case for uh, targeting of political supporters, for instance, people with uh, particular views on a given issue could be identified. And this could be, I suppose, by any political party, it could be done by the transhumanist party to seek out supporters. So uh, could you elaborate on that a bit more? Sure. And, and I'll let Mike follow up because he has a deeper understanding of it. But I'm, I'm really intrigued by the idea that Politicians can use idea market and say, this is what I believe. This is my stance on this. Rate it, whatever they want. People can then rate with them. They can see who's agreeing, who's disagreeing. They can have a conversation with them. That earns their party money along the way. And um, uh, there was something else I wanted to say about that. But Mike, go ahead and jump in. Yeah, I love that use case of kind of starting conversations as a politician to raise money for a campaign while simultaneously identifying people who, you know, might closely align with you. I think that's a super cool idea. Um, I hadn't actually thought of that before. So I love that. And uh, that's kind of an infinitely useful thing. Um, what I had thought of in terms of politics, or actually it was recommended to me by somebody else, was... Um, using idea market to record uh, politicians positions on things and then they can challenge their opponent to record theirs because it's a lot easier to um, it's a lot easier to calculate coherence than truth or wisdom or something like that and why why trust someone if they can't even agree with themselves so if you put you know opinions on chain um, it's, it's a commitment to a particular stance. I believe politicians should have a particular stance. That's my personal opinion. I, I, as a voter, would like the people in office to have a particular point of view. That's kind of the base, you know, base level. And uh, so I, I think Idea Market will kind of, uh, could be fertile ground for these kind of provocative little debates. Like if you have a candidate who says, these are my positions on 10 things, let's see yours, Mitt Romney. Let's see yours, you know, whatever, and uh, actually have people commit to their beliefs, not in any financial way, not in any kind of way with a stake in it, only to be clear, only to be clear, to say I'm 76% sure, you know, broccoli cures cancer or whatever the issue may be. Just be clear that like we all ought to agree that that's like a really basic ingredient in political campaigning. And it's not really... Uh, uh, solved for in any in any particular way. So if if we can help with that and uh, kind of encourage these little frothy back and forths, 
that take place uh, with with this kind of clarity that's never been available before, uh, I think it could be really interesting. Indeed. And well, could I could I jump in on that? Since, yes, uh, it's, please. Uh, it's a political question. Yeah, this is exactly um, the reason I've run three times with no money. I mean, my slogan was kind of keeping the money out of politics without raising or spending any. But, you know, I got invited to the, the, the candidates fora and um, there's League of Women Voters puts up a p great page actually called Voters Edge, which lets you post all of your campaign policies for free. But, uh, yeah, this could really supercharge that that kind of thing. Um, I could I could see you know, kind of merging between you know, smart contracts and the Chamber of Commerce and, you know, heck, I think a lot of cities could become uh, uh, resident owned communities with, with something like this, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, here in Thousand Oaks, we have a, a municipal corporation with a billion dollar budget. Uh, you know, is it wrong to have a private public partnership where maybe people get dividends from their city governance? Uh, but this could totally facilitate something like that. So uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, did you make this ecosystem kind of uh, open source for developers or uh, um, is, is the, you know, the code something that can be uh, modified on GitHub and, and repurposed? To... Yes, yes. Everything wow. is as open source as humanly possible. That's just kind of the way of the world in, in the crypto industry. Um, the front end and back end might have some closed source aspects that maybe protect personal information or, or something like that. But uh we we want to be as open source as possible. All the data is open source. All the smart contracts are open source. Um, yeah, if there's something that you want to use and it doesn't seem immediately available at github.com slash idea market, uh, just let me know and I'm, I'm sure we'll figure great. out a way to help you out. Yeah, because I, could, I can see where this could actually become like a rewards program. You know, I mean, people are worried about inflation. You know, what if you could get a discount from people who believe the same <laughs> ideological things that you do? Yes, is, yes. Actually, a friend of mine is working on something like that. Connor McCormick, right. look him up on Twitter. He's a he's a genius. Yeah, I mean that would take off like a like a prairie fire, <laughs> as they say in, in politics. But uh, yeah, I'm um, totally excited about this. I think I think you answered my question, so I'll pass the baton. And uh... very interesting. <laughs> totally, so... cool, totally cool. Art Ramon Garcia, who is our director of visual art, suggests perhaps having a GPT-3 AI create a consolidation of all ratings for a given idea as a running result. I'm wondering what you think of the plausibility of this idea. So have some sort of AI system essentially mine the responses to a particular uh, question or issue and construct a narrative based on the user responses and ratings. Do you think there's a possibility of that sort of system creating a coherent and accurate summary of which ideas are favored, which are not favored, what the particular arguments are that have been made back and forth? Yeah, I think there are two potential answers to this. One is definitely yes. Absolutely. And I think it was Jason who mentioned to me a while back that AI or machine learning models train themselves most naturally on knowledge graphs anyway. So boom, just yes, by all means, plug it in, play with it. And and that that just sounds like an incredibly generative thing to experiment with. So on, on, that, on that note, yes. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is in the kind of traffic map visualization model, um, I'm anticipating a time when, like with traffic maps, we can get directions. What's the most common set of reasons that people believe both Christ is Lord and Joe Biden is a hologram? Let's see the string of arguments that connects those two most frequently. Let's see the most direct route from A to B or the most direct route according to my personal trusted circle. Um, so that, that wouldn't even require AI because it's just a matter of sequencing the data that's uh, on chain. There's no really analysis uh, necessary. But um, yeah, I, I, would love, I would love all those things. You can kind of create um, spontaneous manifestos by saying, all right, how do you get from this idea to that idea uh, in the most credible or most publicly believed way? And then like Dan was asking earlier, are there time-based things? All right, what would have been the most credible highway from idea A to idea B five years ago. 
Um, I just, I think there's kind of an infinite playground of, of analytics to, to enjoy here. And uh, I look forward to all of it. Excellent. So now I wanted to pivot a bit because I know Ben had a more general philosophical question and I hope to uh, ask a bit of a philosophical question myself. So Ben, please go ahead. So we are going away from idea market entirely and to your blog, Mike. Um, I guess first, I think I looked at your Twitter handle and I saw that you were listed as ex-atheist. And I don't think I'd seen that term before. And so I kind of dug around. I was like, oh, that's curious. Um, but then I also had um, uh, in, into your blog uh, looking at that moral law is greater than fear of tr truth. That article, I think it's from back in August. Um, just wanted to get some more clarity about that. And uh, the last statement, specifically the uh, quote, moral law makes geniuses into idiots and vice versa. And I'll find that link for Janati right now. Sure. So, wow, there's there's a lot there. And I'd, I'd love to talk about any of it. Was there any particular place that you wanted me to start or focus on to make sure we definitely address? Um, you might just want to start from like where you come from as like you were originally an atheist or you sure, were originally yeah. Christian and how you, what's your path to where you are now? Sure. So, um, just for reference, the long version of this answer is in, uh, my pinned tweet on Twitter. There's a Google doc that I, I wrote out my kind of personal journey in just a kind of relatively detailed way. But the short version is, um, I was raised in a Jewish agnostic household, never really thought about God or religion at all until I saw George Carlin's comedy. And George Carlin said, uh, you know, people actually believe that there's a man in the sky who watches everything you do. And he has a list of 10 things that he does not want you to do. And if you do any of them, he will send you to a place of fire and burning and torture forever. And he loves you. And when I was about 12, I went, that makes sense. Guess I'm an atheist. And it was just, all right, done. And then I had a wonderful, you know, world of things to argue about with Christians for years. And actually, long, weird story, Leah was part of that. She, she was raised Christian. And, you know, when we were teenagers, we would argue. And I was the staunch atheist and she was the staunch Christian. We would just go like this. And um, uh, what happened was... At the same time I was, I was an atheist, I was getting tired of getting shot down by my crushes. I liked pretty girls and they would always not go out with me. And uh, being kind of a nerd, I wanted to solve this by figuring it out. So I went online, I read psychology books, I, I went online and did the thing. I, I learned from the people who would eventually be called the seduction community. This was back in 2003 and four. So there were a lot less weird actors in it at the time. And uh, one of the books that uh, David D'Angelo for my super old school seduction community listeners will recognize. Uh, one of the books that he recommended was called Radical Honesty by a psychologist named Brad Blanton. And he recommends being completely honest all the time about all your weird little thoughts, uh, no matter what. And I started experimenting with this in high school. And if I did something... Uh, you know, mischievous and got caught, I would tell the administrator, oh, I just didn't expect you to be here. And if you hadn't been here, I was going to go do this other mischievous thing. But here we are. And when I would do that, the situation would resolve itself much more harmoniously and favorably than I possibly could have contrived. And so even as an atheist, I started to get this felt sense that truth is a force that is good and will work with you if you work with it. And I was still an atheist. I didn't consider this to be a spiritual experience, but this gave me a very tactile and visceral trust in truth as a general thing. And that trust, you know, became... Uh, you know, it was just very encouraging for me to the point where a couple of years later, when I was, you know, further down the, um, you know, personal development rabbit hole and focused very much on authenticity and, you know, what, what makes a good man, what's virtue, what is, you know, what does it mean to be myself and all those things? Um, you know, I started, 
I started meditating and I, I had uh, spiritual experiences that just revealed that there was some, there's an invisible, invisible reality that is, that goes beyond the body. And I just had, had, and, and brings incredible peace and reality and clarity and to perception and everything. And it would just, it, it turned the lights on and said, all right, there's, there's something else. There's something else here. And um, before that, I had actually, uh, I reached, you know, a certain moment with that trust in the truth where I said, you know, I've been an atheist all this time. I've bothered people a lot. I've really made a show of what an atheist I am. And yet, if there is a God, I'm willing to know. And that was just, you know, I prayed that to nobody. And that's when the spiritual experiences started to happen. And when uh, incredibly unlikely synchronicities would lead me to just the right book or just the right person. And it was a very gentle, extraordinarily gentle almost like hand almost like leading by the hand or following a trail of breadcrumbs that led to a complete uh, inversion of my atheism and i'd started to just have this constant personal relationship with uh, divine orderliness and benevolence and uh, love and uh, it just it transformed my whole life and spiritual work kind of took over as as the chief aim uh, at least in intention uh, over, you know, getting a hot girlfriend or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's how my atheism was reversed. But at the same time I was, uh, Jewish, my grandparents survived the Holocaust. So becoming Christian was never, ever an option. And, um, you know, that, that changed, that changed later too. Even, even, you know, during that period, I did a little experiment one day and I was meditating and I, just kind of for scientific curiosity, I said, well, if Christ is divine and he's alive and all those things they say are true, then the only reason I can't see him right now is because I doubt it too much. So I kind of sat down on my bed and closed my eyes and went, all right, Jesus is in the room with me right now. And every time a thought or a feeling that would come in that go, yeah, right now, I just push it out of the way, almost like um, trying to dig to the bottom of of like a bowl of baked beans. Like you push them to the side and they rush back in. But if you can get, if you can be vigorous enough, you can keep like this kind of white bottom of the bowl showing in the middle for a few seconds at a time. I was kind of doing that mentally and digging a tunnel to like through my doubt that Jesus could be in the room with me. And then all of a sudden he was. And I didn't, I didn't see him visually, but I felt an internal golden light shower down and a presence announce itself non silently as Jesus Christ. And I basked in this sparkling golden love for a few moments. And then I said, all right, now I know that. I had no plans to become a Christian because it would kill my father. Um, but yeah, I, you know, that's, 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 that's what opened up, you know, the reality of Christ for me. And, um, you know, the story gets a lot longer. I went through some very hard times and on my way out of them, uh, I was just kind of desperate to reconnect with God. And I was going to church a lot because I was in love with Leah and she was born and raised uh, Christian. And uh, one day I just kind of was thinking to myself, all right, what's actually prohibiting me from accepting Christ? And I just kind of felt whatever, what the, I, I imagined myself accepting Christ and go, what's the main emotion that comes up here that makes me go, no, get out of here. And it was humiliation. The humiliation of having been a Jew all this time and saying, no, I don't need this. This is not good for me. It'll hurt, you know, and this will like take away my identity or something like that. And I said, I said to God, I am willing to endure this humiliation for you, O Lord. And later that day, I allowed myself to say a prayer to accept Jesus into my heart. And uh, it felt very Jewish. It was kind of like diving into a cold pool. Like it, it, it seems terrifying at first, and then you get in, and then once you're in, it's all right. 
And, uh, and none of the things that I feared would happen happened. I didn't feel less Jewish. I didn't feel humiliated. I didn't feel broken. I actually felt very elevated and peaceful. And um, uh, my dad is fine. We can't talk about it. He, he won't talk with me about it, of course. And it, it, you know, it hurts him, but we still have a good relationship. And, uh, you know, I've, I've recently, that was about two years ago. And I've recently fallen in love with uh, Catholicism as the continuation of, of the Jewish tradition in a post messianic sense that uh, all of the intellectual and, and cultural depth and, and direct, you know, relationship with God that Jews and intellectuals and mystically inclined people um, are, are, often uh, looking for in Christianity is, has been realized for me in, in Catholicism and that the general, the general, you know, fundamental kernels around which Catholicism uh, seems to be based and seems to have been built in hindsight are the fundamental kernels on which I seem to have been built. I look at my life and go, Oh, I've always loved cathedral architecture. I've always loved Bach. I've always loved, uh, you know, to read, you know, the stories of the saints and their mystical uh, encounters with the divine and things like that. So uh, it's been kind of a beautiful harmonizing agent for me. Uh, like I've found, found the center, I've found the bullseye of, of, of the target that I've been just swirling around my whole life. And it's just a really uh, dazzling adventure lately. So it's interesting because uh, I quite admire cathedral architecture as well. Now, I am an atheist, and I recall uh, during one of the philosophical presentations that I gave when I was a college student, uh, one inquirer asked, well, what would it take you to uh, change your mind about this and start believing in God? And I replied, well, if God is real and God is omnipotent and God wants me to believe in him, why wouldn't he cause $1 million in gold to materialize immediately in front of me? And then that would be a very clear indication that uh, there's some sort of feedback that would convince me. And one of the professors replied, yes, certainly God could lead that to happen. But then the caveat is you would have to give the million dollars away. And I said, I would be fine with that because I know what I would give it away to, and that would be to research on human life extension so that we would have more time to engage in these kinds of conversations and really further a value that should be common to all of us. So uh, I'm still going to tempt God if he exists to cause a million dollars in gold to materialize right in front of me, knowing what I would do with that money. But until then, I will remain an atheist. But what I will say, Mike, is that I enjoyed another article that you had written recently called Beating the Final Boss of Philosophy. And that resonated to me because the key insight it communicates is Philosophy can teach you so much, but you get to a certain level in your understanding of it where you realize there are other disciplines, other fields of endeavor that are needed to get you further in life. And I think I reached that stage fairly early in my life, in my early 20s, when I realized oh, it's not just enough to have accurate insights about the world one has to implement them in practice. And that could be through an enterprise, through a company like Idea Market or a platform or an organization like the US Transhumanist Party, which tries to influence public opinion to be more receptive to this new era of civilization that is being created. So I would encourage our viewers to read Mike's blog and to consider not just philosophy, but practical implementations of ideas and the knowledge that's necessary to do that. So we have about 30 seconds remaining. Uh, I will let you have the last word, Mike, with regard to this conversation. 
Thank you so much. I wanted to address something Ben wanted to talk about super early, the uh, the moral law versus fear of truth article that I wrote. And the basic uh, premise there is that when we take actions, we like to justify them. If I uh, kill someone for being gay, it'll be particularly difficult for me to realize that being gay doesn't deserve murder or something like that. So through our actions, we affect our epistemology through our willingness to entertain new ideas and uh, confrontational ideas. So if we, uh, if we behave immorally, we add a debt of guilt that we must get through in order to get to the truth that simply presents itself without such cost to someone who has not behaved immorally. Um, so there's this kind of indelible bind between action and epistemology that uh, can turn a genius into an idiot by making him unwilling to see what is so plain to someone who has uh, less less reason to avoid uh, noticing what's right under their noses. Very interesting. And thank you for joining us today, Mike and Leah, and for your very thorough explanation of idea market, as well as delving into these very interesting philosophical questions. I hope that people will check out idea market and Mike's blog. And until next time, may we all live long and prosper.